Funding for this program is provided in part by the Self Family Foundation and the Humanities Council, South Carolina. Southern states fought the desegregation of their public schools with massive resistance, and South Carolina was the last to comply. But in 1963, Harvey Gantt integrated Clemson College peacefully. His success did not come without struggle. On January 28, 1963, 20-year-old Harvey Gantt headed for his first day at Clemson College. NAACP attorney Matthew J. Perry drove him to Clemson, along with his father, Christopher Gantt, and the Reverend A.R. Blake, pastor of Harvey's church. It was the end of a journey and the beginning of the desegregation of South Carolina's public schools. Harvey Gantt grew up in the segregated South, South Carolina's constitution required separate but equal schools for blacks and whites. But there was no equality. The last year that we have statistics on segregated schools, 1960, we were spending the state of South Carolina 50% more on every white student than on a black student. There was nothing, anything close to equality. The Gants lived in Charleston, South Carolina. Harvey's father worked at the naval shipyard, providing a stable life for the family. We were quite comfortable living in the segregated society we were living in. Um, you know, we knew we walked past uh, white elementary schools to go to our elementary schools. Uh, the same would be for the high school. We knew we sat at the back of the bus. And we did all those things obediently and didn't feel um, badly about living in a segregated society. Of course, when we were younger children. We didn't see the rightness or wrongness or morally of what was going on. Harvey was the oldest child of Christopher and Wilhelmina Gant. While they may have protected their children from the full impact of life under Jim Crow, the Gants were well aware of the need for change. Christopher Gant was a member of the South Carolina Conference of the NAACP, led from 1941 to 1958 by the Reverend James Henton. As Harvey Gantt was growing up, the South Carolina NAACP won many civil rights battles. They take on the equalization of teacher salaries. They are successful. They take on uh, issues of racial violence. They pursue issues of the right to vote and make an effort to crack over the Democratic Party. And by 1948, as a consequence of the NAACP's work, uh, African Americans are now able to vote for the first time as Democrats in South Carolina. And then in the late 40s is when the State Conference of the NACP of South Carolina and the National Office of the NACP began to work in a more concerted effort to challenge the question of inequality in schools. In rural Clarendon County, inequality was stark. White children rode the bus to school while black children had to walk a group of black parents circulated a petition demanding equal educational advantages for their children. The first to sign were Harry and Eliza Briggs. Their petition was denied, and the NAACP filed a lawsuit known as Briggs versus Elliott. The National Office of the NAACP sent Thurgood Marshall to Charleston to argue the Briggs case. Cecil Williams, 11 years old, was there with his camera. All I knew in, in the mind of an 11-year-old person at the time was this big lawyer from New York was coming down to this big, important case. And, um, and so um, as he was stepping off the train with his Samsonite suitcase, um, I snapped that picture. In that case, Briggs v. Elliott later becomes a part of the Brown v. Board decision and becomes a defining moment uh, in the civil rights story. Uh, in, the, in the nation. I can still see the headlines uh, from the Charleston Evening Post that said segregation was unconstitutional. And that kicked off a whole 
set of discussions, what I call dinner table conversations, uh, about the rightness and wrongness and issues of race. We were influenced by my father who took us to uh, uh, speeches that were made by civil rights leaders who came to town, Roy Wilkins and James Farmer and people like that. So we, were, we had a growing awareness of, of um, civil rights. But state leaders and business people began to devise ways to circumvent the Supreme Court ruling. Rather than a state agreeing with the ruling of the United States Supreme Court, uh, there was actual determined efforts to resist. Uh, and the massive resistance movement, which came all along the Atlantic seaboard in that period, to circumvent the Supreme Court ruling. Massive resistance particularly formulated in Virginia and in South Carolina, it was going to use the courts to fight every instance of every opportunity to desegregate. The state legislature authorized the creation of the South Carolina School Committee, headed by State Senator Marion Gresset, to lead the official fight to maintain segregation in the public schools. Well, the NACP took the courts at its word and kept pushing for, uh, in the courts, uh, and in the media trying to persuade the state to sort of fall in line uh, with the rest of the South. And many people suffered because of their association with the NAACP. Uh, people were fired from their jobs. If you said you were a member of the NAACP, then you could not be a school teacher in South Carolina. Do you feel that the real drive for integration is coming from the Negro In 1959, South, South Carolina Senator Olin Johnston expressed widely held views about the NAACP. I do not think that the colored people themselves are behind this drive. I know it's not true in my state. I think it is outsiders, the NAACP and other left-wing groups that are pushing the matter uh, at the present time. If they were left alone, we would have no agitation in the South for integration. In the late 50s and early 60s, J. Arthur Brown of Charleston headed the South Carolina NAACP. His daughter, Millicent Brown, helped to desegregate the Charleston schools. The NAACP was a reform organization. And while some people use the, they, they throw that word revolutionary out very loosely. The truth is, this was not an organization trying to overthrow anything. When the Klan would ride by and threaten and taunt, um, when they burned a cross on our front steps, um, that was frightening. But it still never got to the point of whether or not we were going to stop our advocacy. I don't think stopping ever was ever even discussed.